Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I hope everyone is doing well out uh, wherever you may be, whatever time zone you might be. This is a uh, VITA learning webinar. Uh, today we have uh, Mr. Peter Peasy. How are you doing, Peter? I'm doing great, Jim. Good to see you again. Excellent. So today we're going to go over the control and balance of translucency and opacity for multiple material options, uh, or whatever Peter decides to uh, speak on, which is <laughs> it, anything is good. Um, Peter's been working with us for uh, several years now, or working with our material several years. And we, we actually have uh, quite a few different uh, webinars that we've actually recorded with Peter. And Peter's gone over from anywhere from A to Z on from uh, prepping, from treatment planning, for shade, for um, translucency issues, for just the canvas, all sorts of different topics that we've been working with. Uh, and he's been delivering excellent messages to everyone uh, for great education. Um, so before we start, uh, let me just go over a couple things. Uh, the phone is on mute. So you as a um, attendee, your phone's on mute. There is on the right-hand side with that panel, there is a question box. So if you have any questions for Peter, please go ahead and feel free to type those in. And then towards the end of the program, we will collect those questions and then we will have Peter um, provide us with some uh, additional excellent information uh, on this. So please use that question box. Uh, Q&A will be at the end of the program. It is going to be recorded. We do have all of the recordings of these webinars with Peter and various other uh, key opinion leaders on our website, via YouTube channel, uh, or you can join us through the LinkedIn or through Instagram, Facebook, uh, any of those uh, social media platforms, you can go ahead and tap into us and watch some of these uh, videos. Uh, and then for Peter, uh, again, we want to thank Peter for being here again and providing us again with some excellent uh, uh, education. You know, Peter, uh, most of you know him. Those of you who don't know him, uh, he is an excellent well-rounded uh, master ceramist, master tech, dental technician, not just a ceramist, but he does so much more. And he gives all of us great insight on how to work with the materials, but also how to communicate with the, with the dentist, how to communicate with each other, right? As technician to technician, because some of you may not do everything. Sometimes you farm it out, outsource. Uh, so you need to understand a lot of the entire breadth of what we do in a daily operation to make sure that your partners uh, provide you with what is needed. So Peter owns his own lab in uh, PZ Dental Studio in Staten Island, New York. He's been a technician since 1984, has a CDT and a MDT, uh, has personal appreciation and expertise on all phases of traditional and digital uh, dental technology and photography, a great uh, phot uh, photographer, he does some excellent uh, work, and we, we've done some uh, previous uh, programs where we just do shade as well, and it, it, they work out really well, and you learn a lot. So maybe we'll get together and do some of those again next year, Peter. Um, he's a member of the American Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry. He's a graduate, recognized specialist, and, denture, and, and mentor of the COIS Center for Dental Excellence. And he's co-editor in chief of Inside Dental Technology. So, Peter, welcome. Thank you. You Jim. are. I'm uh, <laughs> that's okay. As long as you're not laughing at me, I'm good with no, it. No, no, I'm joking about some Jen <laughs> sitting in the office with me, and I'm making fun of something. But uh, no worries. You want to share? You, you got to lighten those days. <laughs> you got to lighten the days up with some laughter. That's for sure. So give me that screen and I'll get rolling whenever you're ready. All right. So welcome, Peter. And I will be turning this over now to uh, P Mr. Peter Peasy. And you have complete control. And it looks like it's good. So I will say uh, farewell towards the end. I'll be uh, hanging on if you need me, Peter. But Great, it's, uh, everything's for you now. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. So I think we're... Uh... We're good to go. So yeah, you know, it's an interesting topic because we actually hit on this topic a little bit in the beginning of the year and I went back and kind of researched it and figured out what we did and, and wanted to kind of change it up a little bit. 
So I think part of the challenges here is just those words, opacity and translucency, and really understanding them. You know, from a simplistic point of view, it seems pretty easy, right? The trans materials are more trans, the opacity is more opacified. So, you know, what, what's the big dilemma? And I think the big dilemma is, is really understanding how to utilize it in space. What is the restorative space that we have to work in? How much? And today that's all over the all over the place. That's part of the challenge there, right? Because sometimes we work in restorative space where uh, it's an implant and we have to build four or five millimeters of ceramic. And sometimes it's a micro veneer and we're building two tenths of a millimeter in ceramic. So realistically, how does that work together? It's by understanding the restorative space and what the restorative options are, especially when it comes to the materials. So I've mentioned before, and I'll mention this again because <clears throat> I think it's important. Uh, I find that for me, what I try to do is work as most as most diligently as I can in this area here. And I've actually mentioned this, I think, in the last lecture we did, or probably the last two or three now, because it's kind of become important for me. Uh, and what that actually is is meaning I like to really work in the feldspathic, whether it's through veneers or through fully layered PFM zirconia lithium silicate. And I get it, but that's not the norm that I see. I, I did a lot of traveling the last few months and I've been in a lot of different labs and a lot of them are really working more on what we call the micro layered world. And I'm okay with that too. I would say that probably about 80% of our profession is really working in this micro layered world. And there's nothing wrong with that. I would argue that the way you separate yourself or define yourself in our profession is not doing exactly what everybody else is doing. So for me, that's always been being able to do some more with what we have, whether it's with a micro layer, learning how to do that better and understanding what you need to make it work or with a fully layered restoration. And I'll just throw one more argument in there from my defense of, of my statement is that when I go to laboratories, especially around the world, I was in Canada a few weeks ago and around the country, um, I hear the same complaints. We can't find technicians. Um, none of them are ceramists and we need people. And I get that, that's really common and, and it's true across the world. Everybody's looking for technicians. But I would also make the argument that when you do find people, you put them in on the, what you think is the simplest or easiest task. So my, my example is no one walked in your office for a job and they were very proficient with ExoCAD and a mouse. It didn't happen that way. You taught them how to do that. So instead of making the excuse that we just teach them the simple things, they're gonna, their value is going to be in what you teach them, how you, you raise those people to be part of the profession. And that's really where the value comes from. So for me, that's form, shape, and still layering is still a big key for that. Not to take anything away from digital, so is digital. But I think that's the key is really understanding form and, and, and understanding how to utilize it with materials. The digital then becomes easier for us. So. When we talk about space, let's start with the, the basic restorative space. And what we're usually working with in full coverage restoration is 1.2 to 1.5. And I said that many times over the years, that this is where, <coughs> excuse me, this is where we predominantly work, about 1.2 to 1.5 millimeters of space. The challenge with that space is we don't know exactly that it's 1.2 or 1.5. Sometimes it's 1.7, sometimes it's 1.1. And because of that, we have to alter the materials to be able to work in that space or that environment. So an example of that might be that no matter what the restoration is, I know for me to make it look somewhat real, I'm gonna need about two to five tenths of a millimeter of translucencies or enamels. And that's kind of standard, whether it's a veneer or a full coverage restoration, I need that material to make it look real, to create the depth. So what really becomes the challenge for me is, what do I put behind it? How do I fill the space behind it? How much opacity do I need? And that's gonna be based on several things. Jim mentioned before that I always teach the canvas concept. And for those of you who don't know it, it's really a simple concept of how I look at teeth. Basically, you'll notice that the cervical aspect of the teeth always have the most amount of chroma to them. The middle third of the tooth has the most amount of value to it. And the incisal edge is what I call a free-for-all. Really depends on the age of the tooth what kind of effect we're looking to create and what we're trying to create for that individual patient. It's not a standard for me. This is where your artistry really comes in based on what you're trying to accomplish for that particular patient. So if you remember that chroma value age concept, 
and we take that into a full coverage restoration. And I think this is actually the model, Jen, that we were just talking about. Uh, I think I built this one a while ago. Um, you'll notice in my substructure, I tried to create the substructure plainly, meaning it's just a coping, there's no real detail in it uh, at this particular time. But um, also you'll notice that it's supportive, meaning that it's not a thimble coping, it's not the exact shape of the prep, it has some support to the mesial and distals and towards the incisal edge. And what I want to do with that supportive structure is understand what should go in there first. First for me is usually always about opacity. I don't really care about the translucency at this point because I want to mask and not let the substructure show through. So I really want more of the opacified materials in there. But it doesn't mean that the opacified materials are going to be the same. I'll give you an example of that. Cervically, I told you already that I want the most amount of chroma in this area. So if I want chroma here, I need to use materials that have more chroma to them. And an example of that might be, the doctor asked you for an A1 shade. The last thing I'm going to use down at that cervical margin is A1. It's not going to happen. Why? Because A1, very thin usage, meaning I'm using a two, three, four tenths of a millimeter, is not going to give me A1 anymore. It's going to give me something more translucent and not as chromatic. So I'm going to have to increase the chroma by increasing the, the value of the material. I shouldn't say the value of the material, by increasing the material that I use. So as an example, I might want to use A3 or A4 opacious material, something that's going to be much more chroma enriched. This way I have the ability to have the chroma that really it should be, even though I'm going to be using it in a smaller amount. In the middle third of the tooth, I always want to raise the value. So I'm going to use something there that's going to help me to raise the value, something with a whiter or more opacified material. For me, that's usually a um, an EC1 material or a bleach type uh, opacious dentin, something that <clears throat> excuse me, something that has more opacity to it, but also has a whiteness to it. And then on that incisal edge, you notice I'm also extending the tip of the coping with again opacious material. And the point of this is I want to have an opacious material here that's lower in value. So maybe I'm going to use something out of the zone that I'm working in. I might use a C shade or a D shade, something that's lower in value, but yet still has the opacity to it. And the point of all of this is to set up my, my substructure to have the most amount of opacity on the inside, but also either absorb light like chroma does or reflect light like value does. And that's really what I'm looking for. And once I have those things, then the, the, the structure or the buildup process really becomes a little bit easy. I could use one dentin after that. I could use one enamel after that. And now I have something on the internal structure that's really allowing me. So you'll take a look at one firing with one dentin, one enamel, yet I use four opacious materials. So that's where I put the, the majority of my investment into that early stages of the buildup then the buildup becomes simpler. And the reason I'm making an emphasis of that point is because this is where the micro layering concept really works if you understand how to get the inside structure correct to start with. So you'll notice one firing. Also, notice that firing, oh, I think I spelled firing wrong there. <laughs> fighting temperatures, see what happens when you work in the middle of the night? <laughs> Ignore the fighting temperatures. <laughs> That's uh, a different language for firing, I think. Um, I think it's German. <laughs> it's German, yeah. So that's a frightening temperature. So um, what I reason I actually even wrote that is I wanted you to notice the surface of the restoration after my first firing. And I want you to notice that what I call orange peel or eggshell type surface, that's based on proper firing. What I see in a lot of the labs and a lot of the places that I go to is you're really either over firing your ceramic or you're grinding so much of it away that I don't know what the firing parameters were. And this is really why the ceramic furnace that you use is really critical, how you use it. Uh, I know I've done and talked a lot about firing temperatures and the degree of swing, but I wanna be clear that the firing parameters are really, really critical. I think most of you know I'm using the Vita 6000. Uh, for me, the, the, the point of this is really that I'm, I'm trying to control my temperature so then that over firing my ceramic or under firing my ceramic. And I will tell you if you fire it correctly, it should look something like this when it comes out of the oven. If you're getting very smooth glassy like matrix, you're over firing the ceramic. Also when you grind on it, if you feel like you're grinding on glass, 
you will overfire your ceramic. So those are little tests that you can kind of do. I'll clean that up and just smooth and polish the surface. And it was kind of just a really a one big restoration. But my point is notice all the little depth and detail that's in there. And again, it was only one dent and then one enamel. Why? Because of how I treated the opacity on the inside of the restoration, whether that's going to be a full coverage or how I treat it from a micro layered point of view. So I'm trying to create the same concepts over and over again. I want to make sure I raise my chroma. I want to pick up my value in that middle third. And then I want to treat that incisal edge based on the age or the effect that I'm trying to create. Whether I want a lot of translucency or a little translucency. And I'll show you how I manage that a little bit more in the translucency part, more in the second half of this. So let's look at it from a material point of view now. So this is the next challenge I hear when I'm, when I'm in a lot of the laboratories is, <clears throat> well, it works okay for lithium to silicate, but not as well for zirconia, or I like way zirconia looks, but the metal doesn't look good. And I'm gonna argue that they all should look good. There's no reason any one of them should. I still do a lot of metal ceramic restorations. I know people act like when I say that, they're like, really? And, and yet when I ask them, they're like, oh yeah, we still do 40, 50% too. We just think we're not supposed to. Uh, and I think the numbers get jaded a little bit because there are a few labs, very few, who are metal free labs, who do zero metal restorations. But in the majority, we're still doing a lot of metal ceramic work. And I think the point of it is, you want to think of it the same way. I want to be able to look at my teeth and say, if I have a metal structure or I have a zirconia structure or a lithium to silicon structure, whether it's a full or a microstructure, how do I create chroma value and depth? How do I create those things in my restoration? So even in metal ceramics, you'll notice the same details. This is a full mouth of metal ceramics. Um, you're going to notice how I've increased the chroma in the cervical. I raised some of the value in the middle third, and I've given the guy some translucencies, but not tons. Why? Because he's got an older, rougher face. I didn't want to give him 15-year-old teeth. I wanted to give him teeth that looked younger and healthier for him, but yet still did all the things that nature does with surface texture, light reflection, chroma value, and the translucencies that I want up around the incisal edge for him. And that's really the point, right, is to kind of make the teeth look real no matter what the material is, or, or what process you're using to get there, whether you milled or printed or um, just did everything freehand at this point, I still want you to get the same clinical results each time we do something, and that's really the key. So here's our patient, finalized all metal ceramic, full mouth rehab, and I like showing these metal ceramics. I feel like I don't show them much anymore. That's kind of nice to pop a metal ceramic case in there. Okay, so the point is now, how do we manage the space? And this is where it becomes really more challenging, right? Because that particular case was a full mouth of all full preps where I had 1.2 to 1.5 thimble metal copings, and then I did fully layering on them. So it gave me a lot of freedom to control because I had the same space to work with across the arch. Cases like this, and these are the more normal cases, by the way, that I see today, right? These are the ones that I feel like are probably 60% of the work that I do, maybe even 70 or 80 sometimes, where nothing is that easy. Where patients have some teeth that are previously crowned already, like the number nine or the two one. Um, they have some gingival work they probably need to have done. And then they have teeth that we should treat minimally invasive, that we shouldn't be prepping and, and making 1.2 or 1.4. So we'll go through our normal process of diagnostic wax ups. And I can tell you that in this particular case, we wound up not doing the cuspids. We just did the front four, and the purpose for that was because you can see his cuspid is actually his functional tooth, meaning that that's where he comes in and home. And if we change that to what we think looks aesthetic, then we'd have a functional problem with this, and it'd have to be a full mouth case. So this became just a four unit aesthetic case, actually a five unit, because I did a single tooth on the lower two, which I'll show you. So we're gonna do the crown lengthening on him, we're gonna provisionalize him, and we're gonna show you where we are. Here's the crown lengthening and provisionalization. But now here's the dilemma, right? Take a look at what you see on the bottom right of your screen. I have a full coverage tooth on the number seven. And by the way, it's a kind of a ugly dark prep shade. I have a minimally invasive veneer on the number eight and the color is not bad. And then I go to the number nine and I got the dark ugly color again. And then I go to the 10 and I'm kind of good again, right? So look what happens. Now I have to deal with masking, not masking. And in the end, I want everything to be the same. So it's my job to figure out how to manage that space, knowing that in the end, 
I want a certain amount of translucency on all of my restorations. What's going to have to change is what I use on the insides here. Some of them I'm going to have a millimeter or two to work in, a millimeter and a half. Some of them I'm going to have 0.2, which means I can't really just use the same material. I have to think differently through my materials. So as I'm working through the materials, you'll see the provisionalization. What I'm really thinking about now is how do I manage the space? And I hope you notice that I managed it fairly well. I'm going to go back a few slides here for you because I want to just show this one more time. What does it mean? Well, when I have the full coverage, I have the ability to use some opacious materials. I have the ability to use some dented materials and then finish with my translucency. But when I'm in a veneer at, at five, six, seven tenths of a millimeter, I still want to be able to use the same enamel. The only thing that's going to have to change is what I'm using on the inside. And for me, that means I might not even use dentin. I might only use opacious dentin materials, or I might use a dentin that has a higher fluorescence in it, like the flow dentin from the um, Lumex kit, or a dentin that I might make into a more fluorescent dentin, where I can increase the fluorescence, use that material a little thinner, and still get the same effect out of it that I was getting with opacious dentin or dentin. And this is why I tell people it's so challenging to really understand the basics of ceramics because I'd love to say it's easy that we just put dentin, we put enamel, and you get a perfect day one every time, but it's not really true. It's kind of what we get from a manufacturer viewpoint, but it's not what we get in real life because in real life, these are the cases that we work in, right? So you'll notice that I have full coverage of veneer, full coverage and a veneer and by the way this full coverage i probably had two millimeters of space on where this full coverage i only had about 1.2 so even these two i had to think through differently to manage the space and like i told you i did do one more tooth on the lower and i used a different shading formula for this why also a darker prep shade and i had to match the lower teeth not the same formula that i used on the upper teeth uh, but in the end, I think the case looks fairly nice. Um, it worked out. We're going to break down a little bit more. I know I'm, I don't want to sound like I'm being vague with which materials, but I, I wanted you to understand the challenge, right, that we face as we work through the materials. And I'm going to skip his video because he just rambles on. So um, let's talk about what space is and how we manage it. I want to kind of define this also. When I talk about managing space and materials, I'm not just talking about the basic 1.2. I'm also talking about when we don't have teeth there. These are the areas that are actually more challenging for us. This is a great example of this, right? This is a lower implant case. Uh, it's going to be a lower implant case. You can see the patient had three teeth where they were supposed to have four, but you could also see the decay and, and all the, the teeth stru tooth structure that's missing here. And if you take a look at this case, did you see this case, Jen? I don't know if I take a look at this one. This was um, this is what was missing. So these three teeth were extracted. But what I want you to be concerned with is how do you manage that space? Can you just use a regular porcelain here? Do you build up your subframe to fill the space? See how the challenges get a little bit more different about filling space that's vacant rather than just the substructure of space. So to understand that understand that the opacity of the ceramic is mostly in either opacious materials or highly fluorescent materials. When you get to the dentin, the dentin is usually at about a one millimeter thick. And when I get to the enamels, that's usually about a half millimeter thick. When I put the three of them together, that's where you're really gonna get the mix of them looking like a shade that we talked about. So in this particular case, to fill that space, two implants were placed. You remember this case? This was a case from a while ago. Um, and actually, what's interesting about this, I would argue that those were pretty poorly placed implants, not to throw a doctor under a bus, but who knows what the scenario was, right? Sometimes the bone isn't where it needs to be. Sometimes it's just challenges, but in general, pretty horrific way to place two implants there that we now have to restore with four nice teeth. So what we wound up doing, and by the way, my doctors usually transmit shade for that by taking, um, composite shade guides we find these work best because they can mix the composite themselves and give us something that they think is fairly close rather than the standard either vita shade guides or different shade guides for paint i think uh, the composite scenario works a lot better for us and in this particular case we actually designed a, a subframe right? you'll notice the subframe is going to take the space and change the angulation of those two implants that were there so i'm going to bypass the two implants in essence and create a subframe that I can actually do a secondary frame over. 
So this way the subframe will go in the mouth and that'll get screwed down. And then a secondary frame will sit over the restoration and that'll help me to fill some of that space because now I don't have the ability for a light to pass through here anymore. I have material or subframe behind it. It actually makes it better. And then we'll place that in the patient's mouth. I would say the pink isn't as great as I would like to be, but intraorally it works and it works fairly nicely. You see everything harmonizes and blends in nice for the patient. And that was really just a matter of managing the space and managing the understanding of how to utilize the materials. That was the case we did a while ago, so I just found that one. So, okay, let's talk about the optics. So, you saw I showed two metal ceramic cases and one zirconia case. I don't want you to think it's only about metal ceramics. It's just, those are the ones I felt like throwing in since I didn't show those cases in a long time. Um, but I'm going to go back to the same premise that I, I talked about before. I want to make sure you understand that I'm looking to develop the chroma, I'm looking to develop the value, and I'm going to treat the incisal edge differently. And I'm going to do that the same for every material I do. What I mean by that is, if I'm going to push the chroma here with opacious materials or fluorescent materials, when I'm done, I'm going to use a translucency that also tends to have more chroma to it. If I'm going to push the value in the middle third with opacity and brightness, when I get here in the middle third for my translucencies, I'm going to push the brightness with my enamels. We're going to discuss the enamels a little bit separately at the end of this, but I'm going to treat this a little bit differently. I don't want these to be the same two enamels. I want more chroma in this enamel and I want more white or brightness in this enamel. And then for the incisal edge, it's kind of a free for all. I might want a lot of translucency. I might want a little translucency. I might even want a little bit of chroma color in there in my translucency to warm the insides of edge. And this is why I think even when we're micro layering and people tell me they only want to use two or three powders, I'm like, okay, those two or three should be either the inside ones or the outside ones. That middle one isn't the one that's going to be the determinant for the final restoration. It's going to be about what's on the inside and it's going to be about how we filter on the outside. And I'll show you what I mean by the filtration process as I go through. So again, I'm building the same. I'm looking for more color or chroma. I'm building more value and brightness. I'm basically changing my transition of my age. I'm going to use mammalon materials for this. And the reason that I think these are so critical is because the mammalon materials tend to give us much more of an opacified material that also has some slight fluorescence to it. And the real beauty of it is, is I can use it very thin, meaning that I don't have to have a lot of space to work inside the material. And this is why these opacified materials become, become so critical for us. And then, like I said, when I come back at the end, I'm going to come back with my translucent materials, whether it's a sun denting or something that's a smoky white, depending on which kit you use, because every kit has different ability to work with. Uh, and different materials that work well, but the concept is not changing, right? I want a more translucent but chroma dentin. I want a more translucent but wider dentin. And here I might want a combination of those. Um, I'm sorry, I said dentin. A more translucent material, a more wider translucent material here, and then maybe something that's a combination of translucencies and not translucencies, depending on what I'm looking to create. And I'm also never afraid to use some opal materials. Again, in some of the kits you have, uh, this is the sky or the azure. Um, I might be an EO1 or an EO3, depending on which kit I'm using, if it's in VM9 or Lumex, or depending on the ceramics that you're comfortable using. But the reason I'm kind of jumping back and forth between those two, let me be clear, is because it doesn't matter to me as much. The concept matters more than which kit I'm working from, right? The kit has its strengths and weaknesses, whether it's VM9, VM13, or Lumix, mm -hmm. they, they all have strengths and weaknesses to it. Our job is to understand the concept of what to use and when to use it, and then it's a lot easier for you to be able to dive through your ceramic materials. And the goal here is the same. I'm creating my chroma, I'm creating my value, and I'm creating my translucency. And you'll notice that when I surround that with my uh, my, my enamel or my translucent, that you can see all the things that I just talked about, right? You can see where the chroma is, you can see where the value is, and you can see where the translucencies are. So now I'm letting my enamel filter over those materials and, and helping me to get from what's inside out. And I usually always do something like that on younger kind of tooth that I'm trying to create where we have a real youthfulness to them. I want to get more of that white and brightness on the inside 
and much more translucency on the outside. Where when I'm working with older teeth, like the first case I showed you that guy with, we did the full mouth PFM, you notice that the teeth didn't have that tran translucent look, right? They tend to have what I call a little bit more of a, a dense look to them, kind of like these teeth. And the only thing I'm changing to do this between getting an older, denser tooth to getting a younger, more translucent tooth is really how I work my enamel because the canvas is not changing. I'm still creating chroma here. I'm still creating value here. And I might just be changing how I'm influencing the incisal edge. Well, here I did the same thing, chroma, value, more translucent incisal edge. So what did I do differently here? I didn't use as translucent of enamel. I used more enamels that are more opacified. I didn't go straight to the most translucent enamels. I might use something that's a whiter or chunkier enamel, like an EE1 or a smoky, depending on which kit you're in. Um, rather than going to the ENDs or the, um, the very translucent, like the NTs or the, the windows, right, where they're really translucent. Because what I don't want to happen is I don't want to get too much light into this restoration. I want to filter some of this light in the enamel process. And that's what gives you that little bit more of a dense look to it. And then obviously I could also incorporate some of the chroma translucence towards the incisal edge to keep it translucent, but yet pick up the chroma and make it look like it's a little bit more of an older or aged effect on the process. So the key here is kind of what I always say is to really think of your ceramic materials as a fancy chess game. And why I say that is because your job or our job is to really know which players to move on that canvas board that you're working through. Which ones have the most opacity? Which ones have the most translucency? Which ones have fluorescence to them? And which ones do we have to modify to create a little bit more fluorescence to them? And by the way, I modify them quite often because if I, if I don't understand that, you know, the king can only move it one square at a time, but I need him to move two, well, maybe I have to do something to make this better. Maybe I have to add a little bit more fluorescence to that powder. Maybe I have to add a little bit more opacity to that powder to make it more useful for the amount of space that I'm actually working in. Always think of it this way as kind of the simple effect. In the end, you want to finish with some sort of translucency. And in the inside, you want to have some sort of opacity. So your, your hard challenge is what do I put in the middle? And what you put in the middle is really going to be based more on how much space you have. How much space do I have to work with? How much opacity do I need? Or how much translucency do I need? Because realize your dented materials at what we tell you to use them as, and I say we as in the manufacturers, the royal we, um, we tell you to use enamel the dentins at eight tenths to a millimeter in thickness. But if you notice my dentin at eight tenths to a millimeter in thickness, you'll also notice how much light actually passes through it, which means sometimes the dentins are just too translucent. And if they're too translucent, I have to figure out ways to modify that either through my internal substructure or through modifying it with opacious materials or um, fluorescent materials inside that to change the concept of how the dentin actually works. So here's the best example to kind of explain this, and then I'll go into the enamels. Opacity, basically at 100 units of opacity, which is what opaque is, you'll notice that no light can actually penetrate through the opaque. So if I opaque a coping, I should not see that coping. No light can penetrate through there. Yet, if I put a millimeter or eight tenths of a millimeter of dentin on that coping, look at how much light actually goes through to what's behind it. That means if your opaque is not good, if your liner material is not good, if your zirconia color is not proper, or your lithium to silicon color isn't proper, this is now not helping you, it's hurting you, but it's allowing the light to go through into the substructure and see what's there. And if you think you could fix it just by adding a little bit of opacious dentin, well, that doesn't really work either. Look at my opacious dentin here. You notice my opacious dentin is only two tenths of a millimeter because in general, when you use opacious dentin, that's how you use it, about two to three tenths of a millimeter. So at two, three tenths of a millimeter, my opacious material is even more translucent than my dentin. So if I put two tenths of a millimeter of opacious material here, and then only eight tenths of a millimeter of dentin, I didn't really serve the case right correctly. I've allowed too much light to go into the substructure. 
how would I fix it? You have a few ways. One, I could thicken the opacious material and increase the chroma or value. Dr. S for A1, I might be going to A3 or 4. Dr. S for A1, I want to increase value. I might be using B1 or bleach or something whiter or brighter. So I can increase those values or increase those chroma intakes by just changing the amount or the value or chroma of that material that I use. That's the one way that I do it. The other way I do it is sometimes I'll use fluorescent materials. I can even put some fluorescent into that opacious dentin and I can use a chroma fluorescent material that increases the color in the chroma or I could use a, a value fluorescent material. Now, if you're asking me what those, you're going to ask what the fluorescent materials are, they're just fluorescent stains, either accent kit or internals, whichever one you're comfortable with. They're just fluorescent stains that I'm going to put a dot of into my opacious dentin because I know I'm going to be limited in space. I'm not going to get the coverage that I really want out of that space. So I'm just changing the concept of the material a little bit. And that's really critical for you to understand that out of the bottle, at one millimeter and a half millimeter of dented enamel, you're going to get a basic shade. That's true. But you're not going to be able to manage every shade and every restoration unless you have the ability to do some slight modifications or to think through your case a little bit better. So I've used this example in the past. Some of you may have seen it. I haven't used it in a, in a lot of years, but I thought it was a great one to kind of pull out because I think this really shows the ability of both translucency and the ability of how to use opacity. You'll notice I've created a canvas here. And in my canvas, you're gonna see that I have some chroma, I have some value, but I did something a little bit different here across the inside of the ledge. And what I did there was I used nothing but translucent material. I actually used a material that is completely translucent. And the purpose of that was I wanted you to see that even with a completely translucent window that I have here, I could actually still mask this if I understand how to use the materials. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to use some fluorescent opacious materials, mamelons, maybe EC1, depending on which kit I'm using, to mask that area of translucency, hide my substructure, and hide the translucency. So watch how that works. I'm going to take some mamelon material, and to be honest with you, I don't always use mamelon. Sometimes I use my effect chroma materials. And sometimes I even mix stains into those. I know it's a lot of mixing and I know that gets confusing for people, but I'm just being honest. Sometimes you need to push the boundary a little bit to make things work for you, especially in today's aesthetic world where you have such minimal amounts of space to work in. You know, realize most of our ceramic concepts were built 50, 60, 70 years ago, right? Of, of the early stages of trying to understand how to build color. Um, today, that's changed. It's changed. Why? Because we don't want to prep teeth. We want to have more minimally invasive, restorative. We have more implants in cases. We have to restore more pink restorations with ceramic than ever before. So the concepts have shifted. I think we haven't shifted enough in the thoughts process of the materials. So here's what I did here to make this a little easier for you. I've taken my mamelon materials or my effect chroma materials. I've mixed them with a little bit of glazing medium. And I'm basically just painting them on over that area and I want you to pay close attention to the line of demarcation that's here where the translucent material starts and where the opacity of pacifier material ends there and I'm going to kind of brush that in a little bit more so I hide some of that little transition with my mamelon material or effect chroma material and you'll notice if you look at it from the incisal edge down you'll also notice that I don't have a lot of space to work in here but yet those materials do kind of come up and down off that canvas that I'm working on. But I want that to be the case because I want to need, I need some thickness to get the masking that I'm going to want it to do. And I'm also going to take my brush and flatten that out a little bit. And I'm just going to very lightly break up. I'm just going to very lightly break up uh, the mamelon materials so they don't look like I put three fingers there. I want them to look a little different. Uh, I'm anti the three finger mamelon concept. It doesn't really exist in nature. It's something that we kind of do, but it's not really that way. So always want to break those up and have a little more ins and outs, a little more thickness and, and not so thick in certain areas. I'm going to come back here too, and just for the fun of it, I'm going to put a little stain in. And I'll use that the same way. I'll put a little glazing medium in it. And I'll just put a few dots of stain around that area just to, to help make it look a little more natural. So nothing crazy. 
just one mammalar material here and one stain. And after that, I'm going to come on top and just put a little bit of a white EE1 or a white enamel, something very white and bright. And you'll notice that I'm going to place that right over the same mammal lines that I did. And again, I used the glazing medium with that. And I'll break that up the same way. So I kind of get the same effect happening over and over again. So what I want you to realize is that canvas is there. Remember, there's a line of demarcation that runs through this. Yet I have a mammal material and a white enamel and a, a dot of stain. So I'm not even gonna really count this stain, it's two powders at this point. And what am I really trying to create? Same thing, chroma, value, and age of the effect of what I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to do that by utilizing this area right in here with these materials to do all the hiding that I want it to do. And then I can cover that with my enamel. You already know that enamel should be two tenths of a millimeter to five tenths of a millimeter. So that's what I'm gonna do. but for this example, I've only put the enamel on in one small area of the tooth. I didn't cover the whole tooth, but I wanted you to see the difference after I fire it, that what it looks like under the enamel and what it looks like without any enamel on it. So remember, I'm trying to utilize this material right in this area here, and that's what you're seeing right here, to do any of the masking or the, or the hard work that I wanted to do. And look what happens when I fire that. I, I love this photo. It's an old case that I did a long time ago, but I think it's such a, a great teaching photo, right? Because you guys all know that there's a line of demarcation that runs through here, yet you can see how that little tiny bit of opacified material does a lot of the hard work for me. And when I cover that with my enamel, I make the argument that that's a fine looking restoration at this point. I don't really need to do much more, even though I only utilize a few simple powders. And I could do this concept on any two. It doesn't matter if you're building A3, um, 5M2 or 1M1. It doesn't matter what your shade is. It just matters that you understand what material works best inside there, right? So I could use the same thing, one or two mammal on materials, a little bit of an effect um, enamel. If I don't have enough space for the effect enamel, like the EE one, I might throw a little bit of the EC one in, something a little more opacified to kind of make that a little bit uh, a little stronger for me to really have the same effect. I can cover that with a half millimeter to two tenths of a millimeter of my enamels, just like I did before, and fire that. And you can see how I get the effects that I want. So that kind of works nicely, um, just utilizing the powders and kind of keeping it really simple. I wanted to spend the last few minutes really talking about the enamels. Um, and the reason for that is because just the word enamel, I think, throws us for a loop a little bit, right? When we look at enamel and we, we pull out our materials from our drawer, we tend to pull out the same materials kind of over and over again. The ENLs, the um, 57, depending on what kit you're using, um, or the light, medium, or dark, right? You kind of have those three or four enamels that you go to. I'd like you to rethink the translucencies of your enamels, and I'd like you to really think more about them from a filtration point of view. What can they do from a filtration point of view? And this is actually one of my favorite slides. I, I had to go back to a lecture from 2014 to find it, because I think it's been that long that I've actually showed this. I think I stole this slide from a friend of mine years ago, but it's a great way to really understand how enamel really works. Enamel is really nothing more than a filter system, right? or filtration system. So if you look at these colored pencils that I have laying out here, you're gonna notice that if I cover them with very translucent material, the thinner the material is in a translucency world, the more I see what's behind it. But the thicker I make the material, the thicker I make it, so this is gonna be two tenths of a millimeter thickness. This is four tenths of a millimeter thickness, six tenths eight tenths. You're going to also notice that what happens with translucency is the thicker you get, the lower the value starts to become, the more the value is dropping on you. So you have to be really careful in how to manage that mounted value when you're using translucency, which is why the value from the inside on younger teeth is so important, really pushing the boundary of the brightness on the younger teeth. But the reverse of that is I could do the same thing with whiter or brighter enamels. And you can see it two tenths of a millimeter. Yeah, I see through it, but I'm also raising the value because of the opacity of the translucency. It's not purely translucent. It has opacified particles in it. 
And if I go from two tenths to four tenths to six tenths to eight tenths, you can actually notice that I could actually shift the value of my restoration in my enamel or in my filtration system if I use the right filtrations. So that's, again, your understanding of when to use which one. And the thought process that I always tell people to use is, what do I want the light to do? Do I want the light to go through my enamel and see everything that's on the inside? Or do I want the light to stop more on the surface and not expose too much of what's on the inside? And the only difference between those two are, if I want to see the inside, I want more translucency, but be aware I need more brightness and value here. If I don't want to see the inside, I need more value and opacity here, and it doesn't matter as much what's on the inside, because I'm going to feather some of it out or filter some of it out in the end. It's kind of like making a bleach tube, right? Everybody struggles with bleaching concepts. I would tell you, don't worry so much about the inside. Worry about the outside, because that's what the bleaching does. It masks the outside of the tube. It changes the optic premise of light and most of the light reflects from the surface. So if I want to make a tooth look whiter or brighter or bleachier, I'm going to use a whiter material towards the outside. I'm not going to worry as much about what color is on the inside. So I'm going to go back to my filtration and just finish with one more thing. I took those same two teeth that you guys saw and I ground the enamel off those corners that I had put on just for the fun of it. And I actually duped that, duplicated that into some refractory dyes. I made a whole bunch of them and the purpose of it was I wanted to build a bunch of veneers that were actually two tenths to five tenths of a millimeter because I wanted to kind of prove to you what the filtration really does or doesn't do. So here's what I did. I built one of those two tenths to five tenths veneers with just ENL, a fairly white enamel. I built one of the two tenths to five tenths with END, a fairly, fairly translucent enamel. And then on the third set, I used three or four different enamels. I might have threw an EE4 in there and, and might use a little ENL, a little END, a little uh, EE2. I probably mixed five or six different ones just to kind of show the differentials of what it is. And after I divested them, look what's happening already. The ones that are two, they're all two tenths of a millimeter here, but you notice the white enamel, the ENL, doesn't really look super translucent. It's kind of masking. Where the END, you can kind of see right through it. So that means I'm going to allow more of the color underneath to come through. And then in my segmented one, if I use an EE5 here or whatever I use, I don't remember at the time, um, you're going to see I can actually see the coloration. I can see where the whites are. I can see where the translucents are. I can see where even some of the effects are. And realize those veneers are nothing more than two tenths to five tenths of a millimeter. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to place them back on those two simple buildups that I showed you before. right? And this is the first one. This is the more chromatic one. Look what happens when I grab all of those together. That white enamel really masks what you see underneath there, and you don't really get to see much of the color. The very translucent enamel allows me to see everything under there. It's a nice looking tooth, um, but I'm showing a lot of the effects. You see the white banding, you see the color and the chroma in the middle third, and you see all my enamel and my effects of my incisal third. And then in my segmented buildup, probably looks the nicest out of all of them. It's a combination of both, where I've increased chroma, where I've increased value, and I've done that all in the enamel. But the one that's the really interesting one to me that I used to always love to show is this one. Because remember, this is the tooth that has a wall of translucency that slides right through here. And when I covered this with my mamelon materials and then covered it with a very white enamel, you almost don't have enough translucency at all anymore. I've kind of hidden all the translucency through my filtration process. And this is why I'd say understanding the enamel is so critical. Yet when I go to a very transparent enamel, I can still see those mammal on fingers. I can see the little colors of the stains that I put in there. And I can get some of the warmth of the chroma coming through in the cervical area. So I'm actually allowing the material to help me to get to what I want. And then at the very end, I have four or five different ones. And you can see how that one looks with different values of translucency throughout it. And again, where are these the most challenging for us are these kind of cases, right? Where I need to think about what's inside, but I also need to think about how to filter what's there. <clears throat> and in a case like this, I really have to create some opacity right away in this scenario. And I did that because my goal is to fill that space. I wanna increase the fluorescence I want to increase either the chroma or the value, depending on what I'm looking to do. In this case, 
it's going to be about value. It's not going to be about chroma here. I don't need the chroma. So I'm going to use a material like a, an EC1 or a Flodentin um, or maybe even a um, Chroma Plus material, but none of those materials are going to be enough for me unless I increase, increase the fluorescence. I'm going to increase the fluorescence by adding in a fluorescent stain. In this case, it was uh, internal uh, number one, which is the whitest, most fluorescent stain in the internal kit. Uh, and that for me is kind of still a go-to material when I really want to push the boundaries of getting a little more fluorescence inside those, those ceramic materials. And then after that, you can see it's pretty simple because it's pretty thin and I have my dentin structure all set up. And then I'm just going to cover that with one simple enamel that becomes now my filtration system. Because remember, we really didn't prep these teeth, right? These are the actual tooth here. So really, I'm just looking for almost translucency at this point. So I'm going to use either enamel or a combination of a transition dentin or a translucent dentin where it is very translucent already. Finish that off and finish my restorations. And what you'll notice right away is I'm getting the same optics of light, even if the tooth is halfway up or very subgingival. I'm getting a very similar optic light. And there's our final restoration in our case. And, and that's for me how I try to control everything. So I think, uh, I think I'll stop there because I'm just about on time. Yeah, I'm pretty good there. Um, I know it sounds a little complicated and I, and I almost want to apologize for trying to make it too complicated for you. I'm not. I'm really trying to make you understand that in an ideal world, taking the A1 dentin out of the bottle and putting the ENL that goes with it together to fill the space gives you A1 or 1M1, it does. The flow with that process is it doesn't make you think. It doesn't make you think, well, maybe I should use something a little brighter here. Maybe I should use something a little warmer here. It doesn't make you think about the optics of light. And that's what I'm really trying to get from you. Because I really want you better to think through the optics of light and why I think that's so critical in today's world, because the restorative options have changed. We don't deal with only 1.2 to 1.5 anymore. Like I said, implants, veneers, um, micro veneers, bigger spaces, smaller spaces, pontics. Our job is to manage all those spaces now. And you have to start thinking a little bit differently from that. So with that said, um, I know you guys may have some questions, but I also want to just throw in there, um, I know it's been a long, hard year for everybody. Um, looking forward to 2022. I think we all are. Hopefully I'll get to see some of you in Chicago. I know my schedule filled up pretty quickly already for that. I think I start on Wednesday and, and finish somewhere on Saturday afternoon. So uh, I'll be all over Chicago like the old days. Um, but with that said, I really hope everybody has a, a great holiday month. I know it's a holidays for all of us. I hope you have a great holiday month and I hope a, a better, healthier year for us all in 2022. So thank you guys for, for joining in, for the amount of people who have been joining in for every one of these webinars over the last year. Uh, and I think we'll have some interesting topics we're going to work on for next year and we'll appreciate your suggestions. So any suggestions you have, topics that you would like, you can just email them to me or Jim and uh, I'll try to fulfill those those hour spots for us. But thank you guys. And if you have any questions, Jim, let me know. All right, thank, thank you very much, Peter. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Um, so thank you, same to you. Uh, you know, best wishes for you for uh, the end of this year and the next year. Uh, everyone is, uh, you know, getting more, ready to get out of their house, you know, go places. And looks like uh, 2022 is going to um, do it for us. So uh, hopefully that will uh, work. So I'm gonna just go through a couple things and we'll get to the questions. Let me put my uh, screen back on. And there we are. Let me collapse this. All this technology. Oh, there we go. All right. All right. So uh, if you've been uh, watching today, uh, great. But uh, just a reminder, I mean, uh, Peter really has gone over a lot of areas and it may seem in real time complicated, but it's really not. I mean, it, it, I think the key, Peter, as you continually to tell people is that you have to understand your materials, what they do and what they can do for you. 
I love the concept of the filtration. Um, so those of you who attended, if you want to go back and review today's webinar, we are going to post it. Give us a couple days, but we will actually post this on our Vita Learning website. You can find those on the Vita YouTube channel. If you're expecting a CE, if you during the registration, we collected all your information. If you don't get uh, anything about CE in the next week or so, please uh, get back to us and let us know. So please visit us again to those, the recording of today's webinar. Plus, as Peter mentioned, there's a ton of other webinars that Peter's done throughout the year, and they're worthwhile to, uh, to visit. And if you have any uh, questions here, you can give us a call, shout out here at the Vita North America help desk uh, area. Uh, there's Paul and myself that we can help you with. You also have some contacts with your sales rep, wherever you may be throughout the United States and or Canada, because we do have a lot of uh, Canadian customers as well that visit us. And then, of course, uh, visit us for the next uh, webinar that we're going to have here. Uh, so we have a couple more for the rest of the year, and then we'll be closing it out. But you can go ahead and sign us, sign up for additional uh, programs. And then here is uh, Peter's information. Peter's gracious enough to uh, let you know that you can reach out to, to him. I mean, he may be busy, um, but you know, you got to just uh, be patient with him and, and let him get back to you. But here's uh, Peter's information. Uh, as far as questions go, um, let's look at these. We've got uh, a couple of them here. As a matter of fact, so let me bring them up here. So uh, one, Peter, uh, question is, do you find these principles apply equally to bleach shades? A hundred percent, yeah, that's question. why I use the example of, of bleach teeth, right? Because I think it's a question I get a lot is, how do we match bleach, bleach teeth? And my argument is, if you understand the concept of bleaching, bleaching is an oxidation to the enamel surface, which changes the optics of light, how it reflects. So what we're really looking to do with bleach teeth and ceramics is, change the reflective surface of the ceramic. And you do that by using more opacified translucent, um, more opacified white enamel, something that's, that has more light reflective ability to it. And I'd argue that the inside is not as important depending on how white and bright you wanna go. All right. And then at the very beginning, you had some, you showed the implants. Um, question is, how do you block out or mask the titanium abutment? What's your method of masking that? Yeah, so if, if it's going to be a, a tie base, which I think is what the question actually is, realize that was a, a gold subframe or a titanium subframe with a set screw PFM. So it was kind of really easy to block out because it's PFM and I have control of the whole case. When you're using a tie base, um, I would tell you that they don't always work well in every area. And what I mean by that is some of the doctors I know push the concept of using tie bases, especially in the anterior. Area. Um, if you have a 3.5 implant, uh, a central is usually only about four and a half to five millimeters in depth. So if 3.5 of it is filled up from the tie base, you don't have much room to go around it and actually cover and mask it. But the simple solutions are two of them. One, if it's a pure tie base, use whiter cements. Um, so I like the Panavia I think we use, or there's another brand that we use too that's a very white cement, and that helps us. The other thing that we do more often, especially in the anterior, is we don't use a tie base. We actually cast an abutment, and then we opaque the abutment and then use a, a coping over that. So we, we kind of, we can opaque the abutment to the base color that we like it to be. And we find those work a lot better. The flaw for the profession is they're more expensive and not everybody wants to pay for that. All right. Uh, you also mentioned that you use, um, sometimes use a C-shade material in the incisal. And the question is, do you sometimes mix that C shade material with a window or do you use it straight? No, so I think if, if you know me or you've heard me say it before, it's my only, it's my main contradiction that I say all the time. I don't believe C and D shades exist. They, they, let me rephrase it. C and D shades do not exist in nature. There is no such thing as a C and D shade. 
we've made them up to try to emulate some things that we see from a value perspective. So very, very rarely do I ever pick a C or D shade out of a, a, my drawer and utilize it. But I contradict myself and say there are times where I want to use a C or D shade to lower value and yet still have the opacity that I need. One of the best examples of that is if I'm extending my coping and I need to get a little bit more height, but I don't want to raise the value, that's where a C-shade actually works really well. And I would usually use an opacious Denton C-shade to do that. Sometimes it might be a D2 or D3, but most of the time for me, I go to the C1 or C2. And the concept is I want the opacity, but I don't want the value. All right, that makes sense. Um... The, the other thing, of course, you always make sense to me. So uh, the other question is, uh, why do you sometimes mix or what the purpose is of mixing a glaze medium with your uh, material? Yeah, so when I'm using mammalon materials, uh, especially mammalon materials, what I don't want to happen, I'm a very wet builder. I build ceramic very wet. And part of the challenge when people start to use more than three, four, or five powders is, you don't want your powder is kind of doing this, like all playing with each other and mixing in. So if I'm using a mammalon material and I've created a canvas on that mammalon material, what I really want to happen is I want my mammalon materials to lay on top of the canvas. I don't want them to blend in. How do I make that happen? By putting glazing medium in this material so that when I lay it here, the glazing material almost acts like a barrier and it doesn't allow it to seep into the other material. And then I cover that material with my filtration system. So it's kind of a mammal on sandwich is the way I like to look at it, where I have my, my, my canvas here, my filtration here, and those materials float in the middle. And the glazing medium allows me to do that. And probably the next question you'll ask from that is, do I need more burnout times using glazing mediums in? And I would be honest and tell you, it doesn't hurt to have a little more drying time but I don't really change my program. I'm using the same program and, and I'm not having any issues with it. A lot of times the purity of the liquids that you're using are really critical. So uh, I was actually on the phone this morning with my friend Sasha in Germany and we were talking about some of the um, chemicals that they put in some of the, 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 the liquids that we use. And you gotta be really careful in the sense that um, if you see your liquid bottles, when you open them, they start to get that little powdery effect to them, or they start to smell a little sweet in the liquids. It just means that the, 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 it's like a baking soda or a powder in there that they use to keep it for a long period of time. It's kind of separated. And once that starts to happen, the liquid is really not that good anymore. And that's where you start to get the graying effect. So uh, I try to use more pure liquids that don't have some of those things in them. All right. Well, uh, thanks again, Peter, for all the wonderful webinars you provided us this year. Uh, we talked, we spoke earlier together about how, you know, can't, it's another December, almost the end of the year. So I wish you and your family uh, happy holidays. Uh, we've got plenty to do next year. So those are uh, attending. Uh, we will create some additional webinars for 2022. And as Peter mentioned, go ahead and uh, send Peter an email uh, or myself um, and, and ask, you know, what do you want to hear from us? You know, what do you want, what kind of concepts, what, what are the, the things that you most uh, feel that you have the hardest time in your lab trying to create or unwind or communicate to a dentist or uh, work with your dentist or, you know, select shades, whatever it may be please let us know and we'll be happy to put something together uh, for next year. And again, uh, today's webinar can also be viewed on the Vita YouTube channel. Peter, thank you very much for your time again. I, I know it's uh, another hour, hour and a half out of your, out of your schedule. Yes, You're behind I already, I'm sure. I hope to be on the West Coast uh, soon and I look forward to seeing you. Yes, we will uh, definitely uh, have some actual, some in-person workshops scheduled for 2022. So uh, look forward to seeing you out in the field there, Peter. And those of you that are interested in maybe attending one of Peter's uh, workshops, uh, please let us know. And we'll start putting all those together, the schedule for 2022 uh, very soon. So again, Thanks, Jim. thank Thanks, you. Everybody. I'm happy. I appreciate it. Thanks, Peter.
So this will conclude today's uh, Beta Learning Webinar with Mr. Peter Peasy. Thank you for joining us today. Take care.